Excuse me. My name is Carol Mankiti. I'm the wife of the former Refining Mankiti. And our family now owns the store. And we're very happy to own it. We're very proud of it. And I just want to welcome all of you here. It's a wonderful evening. It's a very special evening with our two African poets. And I know that Ifan, you would have been delighted <laughs> knowing that there's people here from Zimbabwe that are going to read tonight. And I just want to introduce somebody who's very special in the back here, Ochena, Ochena. <laughs> He's come from South Africa to be the director of the Imengidi Institute, which my husband also had a vision for in Worcester. And uh, he just arrived a few days ago, but mm. he has a big job ahead of him there. And it might be something you all, some of you might even be interested in the work that's going to be done there. So um, welcome. And I know you'll enjoy a wonderful reading. Thank you for coming. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Knows that he would be very happy because he's from Africa. Oh, yeah, Nigeria. Yeah. Nigeria. Wow. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, hello. I just want to echo once again thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. We are here to hear from two phenomenal poets. Uh, it's truly a special night. Um, first up, uh, Titi Jaji will be opening for us tonight. Uh, her most recent volume of poetry, Mother Tongues, received the Cave Canam Northwestern University Press Prize. Her first collection, Beating the Graves, uh, and her chapbook, Carnival, were both published by the African Poetry Book Fund. Javi was born and raised in Zimbabwe and moved to the U.S. to study mm -hmm. classical piano as well as literature. Her poems often evoke music, the sacred, migrancy, and ecological crisis. Her poems have also appeared in Harvard Review, the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, Black Renaissance Noir, Almost the Island, Prairie Schooner, Bitter Oleander, and the list goes on. Uh, in addition, she's read at the Poetry Foundation, Library of Congress, and the United Nations, among other places. A former fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, Jaji earns her living as an associate professor at Duke University and is the author of Africa and Stereo, Music, Modernism, and Pan-African Solidarity. Uh, a special thank you extended to her for flying in from North Carolina to be here with us tonight. It's pretty amazing. So Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's really um, very moving to be in a space like this and with someone who is dear for many reasons, not least of which because he's the father of my daughter, <laughs> by, which, by which I mean that his um, partner is a, a, an incredibly dear friend and sister. And in Zimbabwe, uh, she would be considered my daughter, which um, is quite a gift. So um, I'm going to really lean into the fact that um, I was a classical pianist for a while, and dear friends from Oberlin are here. Um, and so uh, the poems today are kind of clustered around music. Hey, my son is watching. Hi, Tembo. <laughs> this is on Zoom, by the way. Um, lingua tongue-tied. Clamped muscle. Shell shutter, hold fast to mum's word, safe box secret perch, mothering a pearl. Seek salt, water spell of pucker potion, brewed from crystals, land locked. Who knows what swimmer's ear called you here? Spasms clutch, tight lip, 
as razors down below. Loose them when you will and admit that one tongue that savors your delectable night. Blue Note for Guy Ramsey, Maestro. Lord, make me an instrument. I am no fool. Hard hands made tools of us. If I had a hand. If there's a balm to make us whole, make it night time, the right time to turn spiritual. Lord, all the balm I have is me. What song I make is me. Lord, make me like you. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. What's mine is patched and crooked. Cow pee road, chicken feet, hog gut. I'll make this song bend over me. I'll make it wipe my bra tenderly. <clears throat> Symphony board dinner with piano soloist for Vladimir Feldman, maestro. After the octaves of Beethoven Opus 58, Muscle memory remembers nothing feels better than bone in hand, fat trickling down the chin. The trick is to catch the fur-lined ladies at table, grab the meat from under their snub noses, taste it before it is forked or knife, and suck out the marrow of tradition. We come to steal back what Mr. T.S. Eliot stole. We come red, feathered, and tarred. We will have seconds. Fistfuls please us more. And uh, five bagatelles. Who, uh, Sylvia and I shared as a instructor of forte piano. It's a very old <laughs> type of piano. <laughs> Not very old. Opus 27, number two, the Moonlight Sonata. I suppose since I'm leaving, oh goodness, um, my son is supposed to go to bed. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> anyway. Since I'm reading and not you reading, I could tell you just a tiny bit about this. So Malcolm used to uh, have people over for uh, a master class once a week or month or something. And uh, we would all sit there and listen to each person and we'd hear him talk about the thing and then afterwards we'd have nice things to eat. <clears throat> Five bagatelles after Beethoven for Malcolm Gilson. Opus 27, number two, the Moonlight Sonata. In its fullness, a Hungarian touch sent the forte piano's wooden teeth clattering to the floor. Opus Once the golden boy fell through a chair. It looked like magic. The trick, his corduroys cloaked a peg leg that suddenly came unhinged. Wads of apologies tumbled across the master class. A rush of mutterings about glue, round pins, and ah, the squared wicker. By the time we were eating dainties and pointing out slurs in the score, he was all dusted off, propped up, and snug as a bug again. Opus 101. <laughs> I wonder if the orchids are there for good form or for an ascending type. Two stacks of pink, one lily glove, one puckered line. As counterpoint, a cyclamen soaks up claret as from a decanter. Opus 53, the Waldstein. 
There are only two ways to choose your favorite note. Always prefer the higher. And if not, simply admit you're wrong, emphatically. <laughs> Opus 111. The pulse, the dainties, the urtex, and the rotting keys add up to that one difference, the high or the low. Each week, the maestro sighs at accent, sloth, and clipped quavers. But first, he arches a mustachioed brow and shrugs. It's very good, you know. His mornings are spent campaigning to mute dinner music in restaurants so we can finally eat like the dead in peace. Oh, Dona Nobis Pachin. Fingerings. After Robert Schumann dies down, there's another one. Um, uh, Schumann uh, knew highs and lows. He had bipolar disorder as far as one can decipher in today's languages. So the other poem, which I won't read, is called Flair, and it's after Robert Schumann's long gone. But for now, he dies down. <clears throat> Fingering. Feeling the way back to a face. I can fade, mind, rack, or words. Shame is what I know best. Only its name escapes me. Robert, my own slow man. I think you called this freezing point Eusebio. Or is it a name I call myself? A yes, C, eight, after sitting my own nine nights. I remember every episode and that wonder, sharp miracle of March, each time the season out of reach is finally out of reach. That is the octave I am reaching for when I play now. Um, so I teach at Duke and uh, last year I was able to co-teach a class with a composer and our students were composers, literary students um, and a creative writer and a musicologist. It was um, the most fun that I've ever had. Like we had never, any of us had the ideas that we had by the time we left. And um, the students who were composers wrote songs that, that the students who were literary people, words, poems, music. And then we had a concert and Louise Thompson, <laughs> an incredible soprano came and sang this stuff. And my co-instructor, Stephen Jaffe, um, surprised me the week of the concert and told me that he had said, oh dear. <laughs> One of my poems to me too. It was amazing. So anyways, this is the, the poem, The Void of Music. Sorry. Ritual object after Willie Cole. Hmm. Through the artist's eyes, we catch this breath of fire, lifting water up to flights. This dead weight sinks our histories back into deep sleep, hidden away to dream of repair. Waking. We clutch at the real weight of a movable flood, catching streams that pour through metal, still cold to the touch. Time takes little care over us. Current flowing, its song sighs across west, 
for wrinkling or it collars us in its motion. Iron pierced for seams of sleep, ease across what was once shift. Now skirt, scarf, shirt sleeve, sheet, warm what will soon cool, stiffen what will turn soft, smooth our way and drape us in the dignity of this new day. I hope this goes okay. <laughs> this one's called Prelude to a Kiss. Um, the whole point of it was to kind of dwell in language and phonemes and that sort of thing. So one always hopes one doesn't frown. I don't read this um, or, or sound it out that often. <laughs> Prelude to a Kiss. Under the water's skin, the mouth, is a handkerchief, sponging wet salt that wake. Is this spilling eye despair or just an answer to smoke, old age, a stray grain of sand? A new memory, a memory. The mouth is a fist full of fingers, soft teeth drift in the deep. A sea rose, lips pink, turns purple in the limpid cobalt blue. Below the meniscus, things float, fingers, hands, cheek wings. No push, no pull. No kiss, only water, brushing a herd of medusa, thick things, soft things, smoothed by water. Smoother still, petals spread in wet, unmetered breath, anemone, anemone, feeding on each other's names, the mouth drowns aleatory in the eye. one on the Isle of Lesbos um, it came because I'd read a story about um, in the New York Times about this holiday island uh, at the time when the Syrian refugee waves were um, first 
as they have been. And uh, at that time, the people on the island um, were able to be with the city. It's not so much on that particular case that we on the Isle of Wight. For the ones who welcomed refugees on the Aegean shore. Months later, the island. Oh, sorry. I should wrap up. <laughs> on the Isle of Lesbos, for the ones who welcomed refugees on the Aegean shore. Months later, the island's sheep shuffle uneasy with silence. Last year, a hundred thousand voices begged to be buried here, not in Alexandria. They wretched as if heaving could save them, but only thick seas of salt spilled onto the holiday sand. Now an island man clenches his jaw. The earth holds his only daughter in his throat. One Christmas spasm seized her. The next, her brother shook his way to lay down beside her body below. Then this fishing man learned what grave diggers already know by doing. Only the boat's lip remained, trembling on a crest of sympathy. He moored himself in his net, a morning pall of squid mined hope. Then the tide turned. His arms flooded full of other men's children come to rescue him from an unfathomed ocean of grief. Mothers, mothers were caught off guard. They shepherded this off-season crowd to the guest houses, fed them ewes milk, took care to pay their stumps no mind. These sibyls already knew from Turk from Greek, how opposites can hurl their waves of rage at no man's land and turn men and women to ruin. If they had it to do over again, they would and could, now that their villages have healed, now that the boy's photograph has won its Pulitzer and slipped our mind. They feel washed out. They feel their memories ebb, their faint, faded, basic rags must have been drowned out by Madaira's siren and Ibiza's disco scene. Once a day, a woman sights a tiny audience across the water. All that these islanders have earned is anxious rest, not even saints stranded at home can live without bread to kiss and milk to rinse it from their lips. Thank Thank you so much. That was, that was really beautiful and powerful. Um, and continuing on, uh, it's especially my pleasure to introduce our next reader, uh, as he is also a friend of mine and fellow cohort member across the river at BU. Uh, Togra Muzam and Hamo was born to Zimbabwean parents in Lusaka, Zambia. He was brought up in Zimbabwe and then went on to study in the hug and Paris. His poems are energized across time and capture movement in a way that is both unique and poignant. His insight to the geography both of the world and of people brings readers into the fold of an impressive linguistic landscape. He became a journalist in Harare and his poems have appeared in magazines across Europe, 
South Africa, the United States, and in Zimbabwe. He has published three collections of poetry, Spirit Brides, Umiguru, and most recently, Virga, a Poetry Book Society recommendation for 2021. Virga was also selected as one of the best poetry collections of 2021 by the Irish Times. Togara Muzan and Hamo has been shortlisted for the Jerwood Alderberg First Collection Prize and the Glenna Liche Prize for African Poetry. Uh, and with that, Togara. Today. I'm going to try and get my volume up because normally I'm a very soft, uh, soft speaker. Um, thank you for that kind of introduction. Um, I would also like to thank the Menketi family and James um, and the team at Grolliers for um, organizing this reading. I'd also like to thank the audience for coming out uh, tonight uh, to share this evening's poetry from the Yet City. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is um, from my second book. And um, Gumi Guru is a book about uh, Zimbabwean, um, rural Zimbabwean life. And what I've done with the book was that I condensed a decade of um, uh, Zimbabwean life into, into one collection. So the first poem is called In the Music of Labor. In the Music of Labor. At first the stubborn growth resists him till each stroke is fluently flung to clear the knee-high grass his task down to an art, a pendulous swing of knees slightly giving, his right arm catching the sun wet off the blade. All day the work, shuffling steps into shuffled clearings, beetles and crickets rising off cordite clicks, sparking off stone, bearded chin sequined with sweat. The heat seems not to bother him, but steals his concentration deep in the trials of his faith. Why the sun rises and falls, why his jaundiced wife believes God will save them all, is just as unclear as why his newborn's unfinished death hangs heavy on every dawn. In the music of his labor, each composed thresh throws slashed grass to sunlight. Each mastered stroke floats timed beneath the weight of the sun burning deep in his heart, the mastered art of his fluent arm with the song the hours constantly sing. Um, I'm going to go to my latest collection, uh, Virga. And in 1986, well, first I must give premise on, on the book. The book is based about events that uh, um, take place uh, through the 20th century and their snapshots of various small events. And in 1986 in uh, Northwestern uh, Cameroon, uh, a lake on a very high plateau um, erupted and it uh, released uh, 300,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide. Now, um, the carbon dioxide was heavier than the air, obviously, and it rolled down the mountain. And there were villages on the actual mountain, and it wiped out um, several villages and killed around about 1,700 people. Now, this was a mystery to everybody because um, no one knew how these people died. People walked through the villages and there were just bodies lying everywhere. And it took the government and several international scientists uh, to find out exactly what had happened because they had no clue that uh, the lake was an actual uh, volcano. Um, 
I think roughly around about uh, a dozen uh, people survived and uh, these villages, no one returned to them because they thought they were cursed. So um, it's a fairly lengthy poem, so I'm only going to read a, um, a short section, well, it's not exactly short, but it's a section where uh, a mother is returning back to the village because they, they did go back to the villages after many years. And she's returning back to the village uh, with her daughter. And this is part three of uh, the section called Returning. <clears throat> first things first, I am neither shadow nor words. Only flesh could fill these bundled folds of grief. These torn, faded clothes you once loved that make me question what I must look like. Your daughter says I slip into the night and sing your name when I'm asleep. That's bullshit. She doesn't know me and has never met you. And all I know is grief from these hills, these hills painted red with absences I could never have expected. Now every thought fails the old practices of this deserted place, this house and these rituals of loss sweet in the ache of time, falling sweet off the road of each breath. The years have aged me, hoary, brittle bone. Walking up from the valley, dawn rose and dew bells dripped off blades of grass. The grass sharp at my shin, at my, sh at my skin, cutting our shins, my scarred shins bleeding less than my daughter's. And I return because I'm lost, return for the shadowed sunrise, the shadowed dusk. And walking, I'm afraid and remember your fingers slipping neatly into mine. The red broken road burning, the red broken road burning with the sun behind us burning with youthful promise. Who we were then was the mystery to unfold and draw us back into a dream only I would wake from. Silence ringing heavy and loud, heavy and loud. Soft pulses of sunlight drip through rotting thatch. Ant mounds, pregnant with life, stand pressed into the, into the walls. And I am here and alone and exhausted by chance, alone with a daughter who dreams of you, but will never know who you are. We stand by the door and I set my knee to the ground my eyes lost in the empty heart. I'm going to read a poem from my first book. Um, I was having a bit of a laugh with myself because um, I realized that um, the actual title of the book is quite dated. And the uh, poem was written even before the euro became a currency. So the poem is uh, called uh, Six Francs 75. Each night we bought red wine from a small supermarket not too far from the Seine, where an overweight deaf teller smiled whenever we walked in. At the counter, he read our lips as we bought the cheapest wine we could find. Never any change, as each time we paid, we paid the exact amount and coins you counted one by one into his open palm, six francs, 75. Late in the evening, he would count up another six, 75, and we'd walk through the narrow streets back to the supermarket, fumbling through rich Parisians on their way to dinner. And you, who loved the city, city for our anonymity, became fond of the young teller, who seemed alone and estranged, and liked us too for the change we brought to his long nights when he read our hearts and lips. 
remember when we figured out what he asked behind his mute lips why come twice why not save yourself to walk and buy four or five bottles in the early evening we laughed as nothing would change the way we bought or the walks we took hand in hand to the supermarket the following evening as we paid we looked into the eyes of the deaf teller and said it's our habit and left it at that and he smiled more so at you from that night on every night this game with him and you he'd lift his finger and wait for the silent words to form from our lips and we'd say it's our habit and he'd laugh the deaf teller as we played our game and all we needed was six francs 75 on those evenings near the banks of the Seine and that small supermarket always paying the exact amount never receiving any change then you left and went away and so heartfelt was the change that each night i cried and it's safe to say that he too sorely missed you in the evenings i still walked the narrow streets to the supermarket remembering our walks in expensive coats the jokes and your pale lips the way you kept the coins in a velvet pouch the 675 that you'd always count into the soft open palm of the deaf teller the night before i went away i looked into the eyes of the deaf teller and told him i was leaving the next day his round face changed something sad swelled in his eyes as i placed the 675 into his palm he then signed to the sky asking if i was on my way to you but no words this time i could say nothing no words of you from my lips i packed the bottles of wine and slowly began to exit the supermarket the deaf teller ran to me tapped me on the shoulder as i thought of you with no change to his eyes he shook my hand and silently said with his lips it's your habit and exactly six francs 75. i smiled and left the supermarket Um, I've written a series of poems um, about uh, chess and um, the poems um, are all about openings, uh, openings, the openings of chess and um, the poem I'm going to read now is about the um, 1921 chess championship, which was played by uh, between uh, Jose uh, Capablanca and uh, Emmanuel Lasca. And uh, the two were supposed to play um, some years before, but uh, they were unable to because something came up for some reason or another. There was a visa issue also involved and all of this uh, for, for Lasca to, to, to play. So in the end, um, Lasca wanted to resign his championship. And he said, look, I think Capablanca is the better player. He should uh, take the championship. But then uh, Capablanca said, no, that's not the way it works. Um, I want to play you and um, win the title fairly. So, um, On the first uh, uh, match, Emmanuel Lasker opens with the Queen's Gambit. And there's an uh, epigraph uh, to the poem. <clears throat> Queen's Gambit. One usually makes blunders for good reasons. For instance, because of overexertion, diverted attention, or some other hidden failing in one mental makeup. On this occasion, the Cuban sun was to blame. It had intoxicated me. Emmanuel Lasker, 4th of April, 1921, Havana. 
42 years had passed since chess matches and card games for small stakes at Cafe Kaiserhof. He'd left Newmark for Berlin, gained prominence in St. Petersburg, Montreal, Paris, London, emigrated to New York, and was now leaving Amsterdam with Martha aboard the Hollandia. The journey three weeks from the Feldgrau waters of the Dutch port, the North Seas of Pyrrhic Hold opening out to the vast Atlantic, where shapes of sky and water loosened to join trade routes washed bright with cyanic light. Plow winds swept over the Strait of Florida, but the Gulf of Mexico stirred and gave nothing more. The Hollandia entering a bay once known for the sound of fortress bells and cannon fire. The Caribbean Sea cresting the esplanade and sea wall of the Malecon. The Grand Master had arrived. And though the city of Columns welcomed him, its citizens still reserved every prayer for the Spanish officer's son. The match was on, each man to face the other as both challenger and champion. When they met, the air was humid. The union club packed. No one said a word. Only the audience's breath caught the ear. Sugar barons in white linen suits perfumed front row seats with clouds of blue expensive Corojo smoke. Every eye trained on the clock beside the board on the wall. The clock waiting to give and divide time and turn thought into movements and ideas and images that would run wild over calm mesmerized scenes multiplied like grains of rice. For years, the world had waited on these two men to meet. And when the German eventually lifted his hand, the audience drew their breath as they watched them hesitated, intoxicated by the Cuban sun. We're just seeing if we have enough time. Do we have enough time? We do. So I'll read two more poems then. Um, every year at my school, um, we would um, publish a yearbook and the yearbook was called uh, The Chronicle. And um, sometime back I was driving by the school and I have uh, certain memories about the school. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to drive uh, into the school and uh, visit the library and have a look at these yearbooks. So this poem is called uh, The Chronicle. They still drew the old roller over the cricket pitches with men yoked like a team of oxen to the stubborn iron wheel. The grass smelt as the grass did, all rich beneath the afternoon sun, the heat flashing off the ground like a blinding flick of steel. All the fields were there, much smaller than remembered, the rugby and football grounds unused, the powdered lime lines washed out by the rains, but the, but the names of dead Jesuits on signs still stood on the preened edges in traditional white and red. Up into view, the memorable, the memorable tower of stone rose with all the dreams of climbing up the winding cool stairwell, up to the top of the turret where thoughts of fields soft with warm breaths of red top met the sky with hope and refuge. But those were just the schoolboy's dreams, brought up, brought up, I mean, brought on by the sight of the huge bronze plaque of St. George plunging his spear, extinguishing our fears of the dragon. Though all that bullshit vanished with age, the hero on the forged plaque 
still remain some old myth that Jesuits like to work on. I'm here to go through the chronicles, 86 to the mid nineties. The receptionist is gray and half deaf. I'm apparently soft spoken. <laughs> so there's a lot of repetition accompanied by grimaces and apologies. I'm here to go through the chronicles. Yes to another question. I did attend here some years back. Yes, an old Georgian, an old boy. The phone slowly goes up to her ear as she mentions something about visits and strange requests from foreign journalists wanting to sit in on classes or have private interviews with the boys. Penny? Yes, Penny, it's me. I seem to have a safe one here. Wants to go through the chronicles. Something about poetry. Her small eyes look up. You do remember the way back to the library. I had forgotten, but then retraced the steps in my mind to get there. Each class I pass, a voice spills from the mock Edwardian windows. The red polished floors tap under my feet and a sweet blessedness fills me that I'm not sitting in those sweat rooms of learning, shadows of my youth, daydreaming about a new world after the first kiss. The study hall has lost all its desks and holds an array of instruments and chairs for classical musicians. The fountain in the quad is gone now. And at first it didn't mean a thing to me, but then a crude bewilderment took hold when a memory tried to find its place in the absence. And how on earth they removed it had me lost. The lawn was perfectly smooth. The weights room where our hands were beaten blue by a leather wad, where iron was pumped on hot afternoons was now clean and had the smell of sweat and leather replaced by veneered computer booths. Outside an office, a boy lifted his hat and said good morning in a way that had me question what he'd said. It was only when I looked back that I noticed the strain on his face, his roomy eyes and the big black words scoured across his chest, faggot. I could see how easily they could have put, pinned him down. The tree was there where we sat at break, trying to forget the color bar that still hasn't faded outside the gate. The smell of masasa leaves and old orange peel revived the dead ache that filled my belly. A mob outside the science lab, fists of other kids. When I met Penny, she smiled. And something told me it wasn't a strange re request to come here and go through the chronicles. She had them stacked up on her desk, all piled up chronologically. Towers of memories, names and dates in black and white at my disposal. I sat down, leafed through the pages, the photographs alive in my head. And after an hour of being immersed in the vivid quiet, the bell rang. And it was still that, and it was still that same high-pitched drill that once brought relief as it sang through the long corridors, but also brought with it a certain dread. And I'll conclude with uh, a poem which is named after the wind, Alize. And um, the 28 year old woman referred to um, within the epigraph of the poem is um, Audrey Maestra. Among circles, there is belief that uh, there was foul play in uh, how she died. So there's two epigraphs of the poem. May my enemy be assuaged by these waves because they are beautiful even to his evil. May the drizzle be a benediction to his heart. Derek Walcott. 
free diving, plunging to the greatest possible depths on a single breath without scuba gear is one of the more extreme contemporary diversions. And last week, it cost the 28 year old French woman her life as a world record attempt off the coast of the Dominican Republic went tragically awry. New York Times, 12 October, 2002. From the depths, there is no sound of rain meeting the ocean surface. Only the grand motion of the deep hoists his wife in gray columns of sea. An arm in the half light will only take her body halfway. The diving sled abandoned on a steel line where water flows slower than the wind's history. When, when the clock counts down, the seconds exceed a time, forcing him to dive and fill his palms with propulsion, corkscrewing and clawing for the ocean's bed. The weight of water darkening his blood, compressing cavities and plates of the skull. And where pressure condenses air, he snatches his wife from another man's arms and cradling her body, kicks and kicks and races for the sky. Thank you. Thank you both for the beautiful reading and Chiara, thank you for the introductions. We have time for a couple of questions if the poets will entertain them. He will try to entertain you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we step back there? up here to the green okay. Sorry. Are these uh, chairs because you'd like us to sit or it's really up to us? Yeah, yeah, let's sit. <laughs> I have a question um, for the younger poets in the room. What was it like um, getting your first manuscript published? I think you should go first because I think you beat me to it. I think so. When is third prize? Um, two thousand and six, I believe. Um, <laughs> Uh, mine was a difficult process. Um, I had started writing poetry and um, uh, whilst I was a journalist and I'd collected uh, quite a few poems which looked like a rough uh, uh, manuscript. I then sent uh, the manuscript to um, several publishers in Zimbabwe, and uh, they all turned it down. Um, so the next thing which I had to do was uh, to try the next country, uh, which was uh, South Africa. And uh, I, the, uh, it, it, it happened again, uh, they, they all turned down the manuscript. So I thought, well, why not go to the source of the language itself, and I submitted uh, the manuscript to uh, uh, several um, several publishers within the United Kingdom, and I got a quick response uh, from my publisher, who I've been with now for uh, it's over twenty years, um, and they said they were interested in the work, and. Uh, but they said the work was still not polished so they said they would work with me and um, it took seven years for that mm -hmm. manuscript um, to be worked into what turned out to be don't forget your own name of the book <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what your process mm. was well um uh i i 
so my first uh, like full length collection, um, Beating the Graves came out in 2014, I think maybe 20, 2017. <laughs> um, I had a chapbook that came out in 2014. Um, and uh, a year or two before that, Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani and Habiba Badarun and Aristotle's Gilmain, um, a group of really amazing and very generous um, writers uh, and foundation layers and um, just institutions unto themselves, decided that it's very hard to publish African poetry <laughs> um, anywhere. I mean, like, there's a Chimamanda market and, you know, like even a, a theater market, et cetera. But nobody's coming around saying, gosh, if only we had some African poets, <laughs> you know. Um, and if they are, they're in South Africa buying South African books or Nigeria, whatever. So they started the African Poetry Book Fund. And there is a whole conversation to be held about, you know, a University of Nebraska being <laughs> at the center of African poetry, which it is in a provincial sort of sense. Every place that you live is the center of its poetry. But they had this competition called the Ron. I think it's Ron. No, I think it's not. Um, the Silliman Prize. Prize. Not Silliman, the, the poet, <laughs> the other Silliman. Um, and it was the first book poetry prize. Um, the first, first book poetry prize for African poetry I'd ever heard of. And so of course, since I'd sent it to many other places, not that full manuscript. Well, yeah, I'd sent a man manuscript to many places and didn't get a letter saying we're not interested. I just didn't get a reply. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I sent it off, you know, thinking, oh, this is a much smaller pool. And as I have discovered in life, it's very good to come in second. Very good. It's, it's almost as good as coming in first. I didn't get the first book prize. Never have, never will. Um, but <laughs> it's too late at this point, right? But they, they took um, some of the poems and said they would publish them as a chapbook in the first of what has become a series of box sets of chapbooks by African poets. Um, and uh, all of us generally knew as, as people who publish chapbooks often are. And um, that was very exciting and very memorable. And um, a turning point because I started to use the word poet in <laughs> reference to myself, you know. Um, but it was very embarrassing. Oh, there, there it is. That, that's one of the poetry book sets. It's the most recent one, that lovely red box and the book next to it, the Reinhardt frames is one of them in there. Um, uh, I'm forgetting his name, the Zambian. Um, but anyways, so the, the chat book was sort of getting on the radar of Kwame Dawes, who is the godfather to many, many people of, of any variety or, or range of backgrounds. He's one of the founders of the Calabash Festival and um, before that was very important to a generation that published in, in Britain and people press. And then he was like, oh, we want to work with you, et cetera. When you have a manuscript, uh, this is, uh, this, you know, like when you have a better <laughs> manuscript center. So I did, and um, they, they took it. Um, and they didn't really work with it. And I sort of wish that they did, because, you know, I, I've never taken a, poetry class <laughs> it would I mean like writing poetry class it would have been good to get corrected but there it is beating the graves and then um that was the first collection and it was very nice because every book from the African Poetry Fund has this little thing on it and then you get seen to be an African poet with other African poets who you'd never be with if not for that and having lived in the states for close to 30 years. I'm quite a lot older than I would like to say I am. Uh, it's not that often that I, I can still legitimately be seen as an African poet by other African poets and African readers and Zimbabwean readers, of which there are a few in this room. So anyways, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Yeah, 
questions. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and mm -hmm. let's give another thank you to the poets. Poets will be signing books over here. Everyone could please take your chairs and lean up against the door. Take I'll just say door. this book is on Amazon. Um, this book is all right, but I tried to get better. <laughs> 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 I just do. I love the Chronicle, but I love all of them. You know, I, when um, I did that anthology essay, uh, I had wanted to. Um, I had a whole set of readings of your poems, and then the guy editing it um, from them, he's wonderful, said, well, that's another article. And so at some point, I have to get at that, and we'll do like a very serious interview that I would like to do, the precise, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, um, it boggles my mind how much of like the world you live in, you know, like these poems are so amazing because it's, um, who would even think, who would even think to be interested in the camera reading of that? And then, oh my god, how could we not have been talking about it forever? You know, one doesn't really forget. Well, it's important to me. It was extremely important. It was extremely important to them. That's what I love. Is it's my new platform, parochialism, which is people who understand themselves to the center of their own creation. And from there, they can tell you, and they have something to say about the world from their world. But they're most interested in saying it to themselves, and then people listen, and they say what you say about the family. So I love it. Yes. Oh, Thank you for coming. Maybe in another time. <laughs> we'll finally get to see each other again. But we'll I'll be in touch. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. yeah. And the, the penultimate poem oh. in which you sang it yeah. sounded like a Gregorian. Yeah. Song. yeah. Oh, and Nemini is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That was brilliant. Thank you for seeing our roof over my head.